Geeks, the biggest news this week, you can only find it here. A man in Massachusetts who was fishing for lobsters was almost swallowed by a humpback whale. I know we should be talking about Russia right now, but are you kidding me? This is why I don't go diving. We have a lot to discuss this week, but before we start, hit that subscribe button below and like this video. We talked about the G7 and NATO summit last week, and so now that it's done, I figured I'd give you the quick highlights. The G7 finished up with a strong communique, which is the conclusion written at the end of these meetings that basically lists what the G7 countries agreed to and the tasks they should follow up on. Now, the last G7 didn't even have a communique because leaders were worried they couldn't agree on anything with President Trump. But even for pre-Trump standards, this communique was pretty good because they made a bunch of strong commitments. On the pandemic, they committed an extra 1 billion vaccines to poorer nations. And on climate change, they committed to reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and cutting their emissions in half by 2030. Which sounds far, but that's nine years from now. Personally, what I found strong was the language on China, where they called out their unfair trade practices and human rights abuses in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. They also highlighted the humanitarian crisis in Tigray, Ethiopia, and they called out the threats posed by Russia for their cyber activity. The NATO summit also highlighted the systemic challenges in China and the range of Russia's threats. Of all the events, though, I found the press conference by British Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the end of the G7 to be the most entertaining. Thank you all for coming to Cornwall and to Carvis Bay for the G7. It's been an absolute delight. And thank you to everyone who helped organize this summit and all the people who certainly helped us put the carbs in Carvis Bay. I'll take the first question. Yes, Beth Rigby with Sky News. The lockdown here is taking a long time. How do you feel you've handled the pandemic and vaccine rollout and when will we be done with lockdown? Well, I don't want to release information in dribs and drabs, but I do want to mention in particular the role of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the world's most popular vaccine, developed right here, given around the world at cost, really, truly the most fabulous vaccine. Yes, the next question over there in the back. Hey, thanks, Mark Landler here with the New York Times. What would you say to Americans who view you as a physical and emotional clone to former President Trump? This was an actual question. <clears throat> well, I believe it's Trump who stole my look. I have always had wobbly bits, and actually my hair's quite unique. That was fun, even though my accent probably sucked, but the majority of you told me to do it. Please note that this is an exaggeration of what happened, but it does stem from real events and actual things said. I asked you all what you thought about Biden's trip, and 64% of you said it was a success. But here's the most important thing about this trip. It was meant to set the tone for Biden's faux pas for the next four years. And I would argue he succeeded at his main goal, which was to emphasize how important our alliances are to us and why reinforcing those relationships and upholding shared democratic values will help us tackle broader national security threats together around the world. But only time will tell if his foreign policy will work. President Biden met with Russian President Putin in Geneva this week, and this summit was a big deal. Any summit between two leaders is significant, but when you have two leaders sit down together who are at the lowest point of their relationship after Russia cyber hacked our entire government, just after hackers in Russia pursued ransomware attacks against our infrastructure, after the Russian government poisoned and then imprisoned leading oppositionist Alexei Navalny, and let's not forget this is after Russia lined its troops up along Ukraine's border, then you know this meeting is certain to be interesting. People have questioned whether a meeting like this creates the stable relationship that the Biden team said they're hoping for, or if it ends up giving this thug legitimacy. So I asked the Glorious Geeks, and 83% of you said the Putin-Biden meeting was a good idea. Sometimes meeting with your adversaries allows you to contain some bad behavior, or at least get things done that couldn't have been done otherwise. And so this meeting is important because it allows Biden to set the tone on how things are gonna go over the next four years. Now, obviously, no one's expecting Putin's behavior to change overnight, but Biden got the chance to tell Putin about the activity he's not going to tolerate, like cyber attacks, election interference, meddling in Ukraine, and human rights abuse, while also creating the space to discuss issues of interest, like arms control, climate change, and the Iran deal. Hallie Tusi, who's a foreign affairs correspondent for Politico, has written about the Putin and Biden relationship dating back years, and she's also been taking a deeper look at the threat posed by the growing Russia and China relationship. So I invited her on the show to discuss. Hey, Hallie, thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me. You've written about how Biden never really liked Putin. And now you've got uh, a lot of people asking whether he can trust Putin after this meeting. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, look, if you go back like 20 years, back when Vladimir Putin first came on the scene, 
from the beginning, Joe Biden was skeptical of him, just basically being like, I'm not sure this guy's really a Democrat, small d. Uh, you know, I don't know about his human rights issue. We, we have a lot to learn. And that has never changed. And so today, you know, when people are asking Biden, do you, can you trust him? Are you confident he'll do what you want? He's very clear that it's not about trust. He repeatedly says this is about verification. It's about self-interest. And, you know, what he was trying to do yesterday with Putin in particular was basically say, look, you know, you can help yourself. You can help your country if you change your behavior because you're losing your standing on the international change. He's, it's, he's trying to not make it about trust, but about Putin's self-interest as well as America's. That's so well said. You know, there's another angle to this that you wrote about that not a lot of people are talking about, and that's the relationship between Russia and China and how it's growing. So what does that mean? Well, these are basically the two biggest rivals for the, of the United States in the world. Uh, they both have nuclear weapons. Uh, they share a long border and they uh, are getting along a lot more than they have in the past. They, they've had a very up and down history uh, over the decades. Uh, but in more recent years, it's gone what Obama administration, I'm sorry, wow, <laughs> what Biden administration officials tell me is that it's gone from being um, just kind of a tactical, occasional marriages of convenience to what looks like a more sustained and strategic partnership uh, on everything from trade, which is growing between them, to advanced military cooperation. And so they're looking at it more as, in the words of one person, uh, it's it's almost a quasi alliance. And so the question is, how long are they going to stay aligned and how are they going to work together to counter what both perceive as their number one enemy, the United States? Yeah, it's like a double threat. Well, I'm so glad you wrote about it. Thank you so much, Hallie. Thanks for having me. There's a major problem growing in West Africa, and if we don't pay attention to it, it could end up becoming a massive crisis. In the poorest tri-border region of Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali, as well as neighboring countries like Chad and Nigeria, Islamic militants are rapidly growing in size and becoming more violent, which is causing the world's fastest growing displacement crisis with millions of people leaving their homes. This month, Islamic militants stormed a Christian village in Burkina Faso, where you have an artisanal gold mining site, and they opened fire on everyone that moved, killing over 140 people, including eight children. This attack follows another recent one, perpetrated by groups tied to ISIS and Al-Qaeda, where they killed 14 people in a nearby village. Over the last five years, there have been over 8,000 deaths due to these terrorists, and 1.2 million people have been internally displaced, the majority of whom are women and children. And they're targeting Christians and Muslims alike, basically anyone who can't defend themselves. So why is this becoming such an issue there? And why on earth is no one talking about it? These Islamic militants and terrorist groups are taking advantage of areas that have weak governance and weak militaries, and they're pulling a page out of ISIS's playbook by terrorizing people, extorting them, and reaping the financial benefits of the land they take over. The thing is, though, the last time we didn't react to this problem quick enough, ISIS took over land the size of the United Kingdom in Iraq and Syria, and then we had to go take them down. I know the US and international community can't go fight every terrorist around the world, but I wanna wave a warning flag that this problem is only gonna get worse, which could mean an even bigger problem down the road we may ultimately have to address. Right now, the US needs to talk about this issue and figure out some solutions with our European friends before the problem becomes too big to tackle. Under the leadership of Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban, the country has been rapidly cracking down on LGBTQ rights, and Orban has been making statements that could significantly endanger this community. This week, Hungary's parliament voted on legislation that would increase sentences for sex crimes against children, but at the last minute, legislators put changes in the bill that impose restrictions against showing or popularizing homosexuality. This legislation was pushed by the same political party as Hungary's prime minister. And so people are saying he likely did it to target the country's LGBTQ community in order to galvanize the conservative base ahead of elections next year and to distract from his numerous failures. And this is on top of other efforts the prime minister has made to attack this community, whom he has previously cast as an enemy of the state and of Christian values. Earlier this year, the government took steps to prevent anyone from changing their gender, which is the first law of its kind in Europe. And last year, the parliament barred gay couples from adopting children. All of this is shameful, but the worst part is that these efforts don't just take away the rights of LGBTQ people, but they're an attempt to demonize this community and actively increase homophobia. For that reason, Viktor Orban and his gang of politicians are on my shit list this week. Two women fighting for LGBTQ and women's rights in Kazakhstan were detained following a confrontation with approximately 30 men at a cafe. 
First, yes, I know what you're thinking, and Kazakhstan is a real place, and not just where the character Bora is from. Very nice, great success. Gulzada Serzhan and Zanar Sekerbaeva are co-founders of the LGBTQ and women's rights initiative called Feminita, which protects and defends the rights of LGBTQ people. Well, a simple meeting they had planned with other women to talk about women's rights and gender equality quickly turned into a mess. They were supposed to meet at a conference center, but then their meeting was mysteriously canceled. And so they moved the meeting to a hotel, but then they were barred entry. And so when they went to a cafe to meet, they were confronted by a group of men who harassed them, told them to leave and called the police, who then dragged them to an unmarked police vehicle. They were detained and interrogated and eventually released, but this is just one example of the type of harassment and threats they continuously face. Kazakhstan is not a friendly place for the LGBTQ community. In fact, transgender people must undergo sterilization in order to legally change their gender. And there are laws banning positive expressions of sexual and gender diversity. I like sharing these stories because it highlights how challenging things are abroad for so many in this community, how important any progress we make here is, and how we need to set the example for the world. Even in the face of this kind of adversity, these women continue to fight for their cause because as they say, they want to see people fully enjoy their rights, life, love, and choices, and I'm certain they're going to continue crushing it. Thanks, geeks! Don't forget to subscribe and to go to my personal Instagram and TikTok to see one-minute explainers on breaking news and on stories that are important but they just don't make it into the weekly show. And don't forget to stay fabulous.